doesn't realize he's already a part of the never-ending story. The never-ending story? What's that? Just as he is sharing all your adventures, others are sharing his. They were with him when he hid from the boys in the bookstore. But that's impossible! Nothing is impossible. <laughs> that's impossible. That, of course, with when you use your imagination, right? <laughs> uh, that, of course, dog. is a clip from the legendary Neverending Story, the 1984 fantasy film that has earned a mega following over the years, with adults still loving on it, uh, and three decades later, kids just discovering it. So this movie will have a shelf life forever, uh, still winning these kids' cold, phone-addicted hearts with its tale of a young boy who changes his life when he reads a mysterious book about the fantastical land of... Fantasia. Paul Preston here with Karen Volpe. Hello there. From the movie guys, and we're thrilled to have in studio the actress who played the childlike empress from the never ending story, the only one who Atreyu can contact in order to keep the nothing from consuming Fantasia. It's Tammy Stronach, Yay! everybody. Thank you. You know, when you said the nothing, it reminds me of currently in the, the underneath uh, the upside down. You know, oh, Stranger it's Things? very similar the idea that there's something that's so close but completely opposite of what we're, our, this existence, another plane. And also just the whole 80s vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, I think that film, Stranger uh, Things series is really great at capturing sort of iconic 80s moments. Kids on bikes. Kids on bikes. That's all you need. E and I'm in. Yeah. 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 It, all that, it's all Goonies. kids on bikes. Did you, uh, when you were in this, have a handle on the whole story? That, like when, when you were brought in to play pretty much the crux of the entire plot. <laughs> And where you just kind of go, I got the lines and I'm adorable. Or did you really get it? Because you sound so wise in this film, beyond your years. I, I, no, I was really into the story. I read the whole, the novel, the book, which was different than the script. And I read the script and um, I discussed it with my mother. And we talked about the differences between the book and the script. I was a really serious little girl, very nerdy. I had a little notebook and I had notes for my character. So... Um, no, it was definitely like I, I was really, you know, I was all in and I was uh, I had a sense of what the metaphors were. And yeah, in retrospect, that all seems required, <laughs> you know, yeah. but but I was cute. Now that so much time has passed. I'm like, I'm curious. Well, but you also deliver those lines with so much patience and there's all this air and there's no rush. And I don't think I even can talk like that today. I mean, you struggled just I now. Just had trouble. Yeah. But you were, it just seemed like, again, she was so wise, but at the same time, it really seemed like you had some stuff you needed to tell people and you were going to have them wait until they got it. And I don't know, like, any kid that can do that. I don't know. I think, I think kids, I feel like kids are so underestimated. I think we grow up and we forget how rich and dynamic our worlds were as children. I think that, you know, like sometimes as adults, we sort of like flatten out how complex everything was for us as kids. And I keep trying to remind myself because I see my daughter and, and I'm doing it too because I'm an adult. And I'm like, oh, I have so many things to do and I'm worried and, oh, and you don't understand I owe taxes, <laughs> you know. And, and but, but actually there's just so much going on in that head, you know. I, I don't know. So, yeah, I, I, I and also... Um, I loved, I loved the character. I thought, I felt really lucky to to play her. So for in my mind, she was three hundred years old. Oh. So when I was sitting there, that's that's what I was imagining. And were you nervous at all? Did that affect you? I'll be really honest. I was more nervous in life as a kid than I was performing. Mm. Which I think a lot of performers are actually like that. You That's know? true. If I know what's expected of me, I can do it. Right? But life doesn't tell but you no, what to yeah. do. <laughs> and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's <laughs> where true. it's like there's something about just falling into a story where all the conditions are laid out for you. And all you true. have to do is let, let go and be in the story. That was fun. Yeah. That's true. Kids are good at pretending. Yeah. Even with a guy named Wolfgang directing you. <laughs> What was the audition process like? I'm so curious how you ended up being in a film that was shot in Germany. Yeah, at the Bavarian Studios. Um, the The audition process was uh, hard. Um, I was sort of randomly selected to come audition. I was in a, a musical theater class in San Francisco, and the casting agent happened to be visiting my teacher. 
because they were friends. And she saw the tail end of class, and she was like, do you want to come and audition for, for this film? And I was like, sure. And at the time, I was doing a lot of plays and dances around town. I was in a little touring company that would go to schools, and I figured it was another thing like that. I told my mom, you have to drop me off at this place at this time. She's like, okay. She had no idea what I was auditioning for. <laughs> and um, I came directly from a play that I did that morning where I was Piglet. So I had like pink pig makeup all over my face. Oh, that's amazing. And I walked into this like very serious casting office with like these really put together girls. And I was like, oh, it's not what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was in love with the lines and uh, apparently did well enough to get to round two, um, which then happened in L.A., and then and you wore the pig makeup again because no, they always say dress the same for no, the no, I, don't I, change. Oh, I actually got a call from the <gasps> casting agent saying <gasps> that she had to fight really hard to get me the call back because pig makeup <laughs> isn't really the right thing to wear. Probably to not. Audition. I've seen the film. I don't it's, know. It's not. They don't use pig makeup. I in the feel film. like it's a film about imagination, <laughs> hey. and they, they should have. You know, they couldn't imagine you being so beautiful mm. under the pig makeup. Pretty much, well, yeah. That's short-sighted. On so. <laughs> You've changed my mind. You know, I have an audition for NCIS. I'm going to wear a cape. I don't care. I'm wearing a cape. You have a damn? Yeah. <laughs> so I went to Macy's, and I got this really fluffy white dress. It was oh. very thrilling. And then uh, did that audition in L.A., and that was better. Oh, good. And then, uh, and then finally went to, to Germany. And all I knew is that it was between me and another girl, and she was on the lot, and I was on the lot, and it was really nerve-wracking because we'd <coughs> flown all the way to Germany for the final audition. So, um, but... Uh, on their dime, I hope. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> You're already ahead. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> so it was a, it was a three-step process. Wow. I think we had Diane. It sounds some familiar to somebody else we had in here where she was flown. Was it Diane Franklin? She was flown to somewhere to audition, and it was just her and another girl just like her and they would see each other from afar and they both knew it was going yeah, to come to down to one or the other and yeah, it sounded that, very similar that, that's one of the great stories of you know Isn't of hollywood walking weird? into a room full of yous yeah. <laughs> there's like eight of yous oh great well, I well stand nobody out. else is wearing pig makeup yeah, you gotta stand out however you gotta i guess <laughs> that's now amazing. i said in that this film is as popular as ever because we had a packed screening of it when karen and i hosted it this summer in burbank mm -hmm. an outdoor screening with food trucks and and snacks and you know the local kids came out and performed like they had a dance troupe thing just mm -hmm. because beforehand there's like a dj um and packed it you know, was so absolutely packed. People were complaining because they had a series of um, speakers, but they didn't go two rows back into the back part of the parking lot because nobody ever was back there. So, so th you so brought them out. Popular as mm -hmm. ever. Do you find that uh, in your... Because I should say, Tammy was kind enough to record a yeah. video greeting for the people of Burbank, and they were thrilled. Yeah. And then you responded to their tweets. Oh my gosh, as that was the they, coolest uh, tag part. You. So that she, she, uh, Tammy asked them to tag her, and they were texting her during the movie, which... Probably isn't always the best, but it was great that you were interacting. Thank you for that. These no, kind of activities really happen a lot? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I think for a long time, I didn't really hear much about The Never Ending Story. I mean, obviously, um, I did the film as a child, and then I chose not to pursue professional acting as a child. And in college, I was sort of teetering. I couldn't decide if I should go into acting or dance. And then I decided to go into dance because the shelf life on dance is really short. Um, That's the opposite of what most people would decide. They'd be like, oh, I want to do something I could do for a long time. Well, but I mean, you know, you have such a short window in which to work as an athlete. I mean, it's mm -hmm. your body is, it, you can't. Better work at the bank. That could go on 80 <laughs> so years. You, so what, yeah, you're what you're saying, saying is you got right into it because you're like, I got to get on this yeah, right now. Like if, That's if I, smart. If I want to try my hand at this, mm -hmm. there's really a, a limited amount of time. That and, makes sense. And I think that, you know, with acting um, and with, you can actually do that later. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's always a gamble how you how you structure your interests. But for me, it was sort of like, there's no question. If I want to dance, it's now. Right. And so I went into dance and really didn't talk about the never-ending story, didn't think about the never-ending story. Uh, I was immersed in a very different world. You don't tell choreographers in New York aren't like, Oh, great. You're in the Nevering story. Okay. Great. Can I, I see that Sinead Granchate again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just sort of not really applicable. So, you know, <laughs> didn't really come up. Yeah. But then it was funny. I had my daughter, and um, 
it changes you and started to look at all kinds of kids' stories and kids' movies. And, um, and it makes you go back to your childhood and the things that you were involved in. And so I started to think about, well, what kind of stories might I want to make for kids and for families? And right at that moment, the Never Ending Story just started to percolate. And I started to kind of get requests to come and to talk about it and to make appearances. And, and it all sort of happened around the same time so it's really fun because it is a world that I'm excited about returning to and being a part of in a different way um, and also just bringing magic to kids you know did you bring the movie to your daughter how did that go down? I'm waiting. Oh, I'm okay. Waiting. She's that so, horse dies. She's it's so, so sad. She's so sensitive and it's I don't hard. want her to hate the film because that would be sad for me. <laughs> it was hard on me. And film. Yeah, so, it's there's some stuff that's hard, like things don't live. Our yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, in some ways kids are I mean, I'm watching the way she watches. She's great with live shows and, mm-hmm. and because a live show happens in real time and you don't have the option of fast forwarding it or stopping it, she's all in, she'll watch it. But with movies you know, it's like this digital control. She's like, I don't like this section. And then she'll forward it and then she'll watch it and rewind really slowly. Like there's interesting. (laughs) Just to yeah, just, just to, to con- make sure to control the flow of the information, you know, that's really telling. That's really insightful. So we just have to. I just want to wait until yeah. she's old enough to just be able to play it. Do you do cons like the con circuit? Sometimes yeah. um, in the Northeast, especially if there's um, a town that I want to visit or go check <laughs> out, like going to Germany. Yeah, it's like when Adam no. Sandler makes a movie. Let's have this one take place in Africa. I haven't <laughs> been there yet. <laughs> And off he goes with no, all his friends. That's fun. It, you know, it's. I mean, it's. I'm going to sound like I come from a different planet because maybe being a modern dancer in New York is coming from a different planet. <clears throat> but I didn't know really about cons until I was invited to one. So I didn't know. I didn't know. And um, I was so surprised. And actually, it's been amazing. I've met all these people who tell me about what it means to them and how they saw it with their kid and how old they were or something that happened in their life then it helped them get through it and it's been really nice to kind of um interact with people in this very human way just person to person friend to friend and I think there's something really cool about that and those people are the people that go to these cons go because they love it and that's got to be more people should do things they love. And they're also I, really creative. Very like they creative. They the most amazing mm-hmm. costumes and yep. the most amazing yeah. crafts. And, and very and accepting of each other. It's a very open environment like every time you've gone. like 10 guys with a giant Falcor puppet walking through yeah. the thing. You're like, what they're, is going on? <laughs> they, they're not messing true. around. Yeah. You see any of your castmates? No. I, um, I tried to see Noah Hathaway at a con, but he didn't come in the end. Um, and I don't think Barrett does that. So... Yeah, no, I haven't seen anyone. Barrett oh. played Bastion, right? Correct. Yeah. Oh. Um, and that Noah Hathaway, you know, I know he's just a kid, but he had some hair. <laughs> Didn't he? Didn't he? Did. Atreyu have, I mean, yeah. the, the, the still the geek girls are in love with Atreyu. They don't care no. if he's like, he's like, he's our hero, and he's got great hair, which he does. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, yeah, but now he's like a lawyer or something, isn't he? He works in the Valley or something like that. Oh, I don't know. Maybe Should we I'm call wrong. him? I don't know. Uh, we'll have him on next. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Um, so, yeah, what is it, though, that, that made your performance so mature in the end? Just your your overall... Well, I, I mean, of course, credit Wolfgang Peterson for the direction that he gave us. And I think, in some ways, um, it's interesting. And, I mean, it, I do think about the parallel again to Stranger Things. I think... Sometimes when directors direct children and trust that they have the professionalism to really rise to the kind of um, depth of whatever the situation is, um, you know, it's it's really exciting for the kid because you're not being underestimated. And I think that um, that Wolfgang really uh, trusted that we would be able to understand what was at stake and. he didn't talk to me at all like a little girl. Like it was very, I, you know, it was very much, um, I mean, it's great. It made me feel all grown up, you mm-hmm. know? Oh, 300, really made smart. you feel like you were made, 300. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's really smart. <laughs> now, he didn't direct the sequel, right? Was that George Miller? No, no yeah, he didn't. I think. Um, so why no Tammy Stronach in the sequels? Is that your choice? You said I'm moving on to dance or, because they made, yeah. then they made two of them. Yeah. But wait, let me just read real quick the plot for The NeverEnding Story, the next chapter. 
A young boy with a distant father enters a world of make-believe and magic through a portal within an antique book. That sounds that like, sounds like the, the first, first one. one. Yeah. So, uh, but they brought in uh, Alexandra Johns, I guess. Um, right. Well, so like I said, we started in pig makeup at this journey. <laughs> So um, I didn't come from like a Hollywood family. My parents are archaeologists. My mother's Israeli. My father's British. So, you know, my mom's like, I guess we're going to Germany. She's doing a film. (laughs) And, you know, I was like, well, have a good time and have a back at school, you know. And so the... When they said, do you want to sign on for these sequels, you know, I was like, no, 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 definitely not. I mean, you know, this is a good bit of fun we're having, but we're not interested in sort of launching a child acting career. So um, so it was sort of, you know, I think that in some ways, like, we really were from a very un-Hollywood stew. We really had no idea kind of what was going on, and, um, and we thought it was going to and we thought it was going to be like a European release that maybe, you know, my cousins in Israel would see. <laughs> Instead, uh, 27 million to make it, 100 million, I guess. Yeah, in, I mean, in I feel like we, we, if we had known how much money was that's in the budget, we million. would have maybe negotiated a slightly different contract. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But well, that's when you come back for the second one. You're like, oh, you're going to have to pay to bring me back. Was she, I, I never saw the second one. Was she older? Uh, I don't know. It looked, the photos I've seen make her look I, she's a little I, bit older. I feel bad because I, I didn't. You didn't see it? I didn't. Yeah, I you haven't seen it? Isn't that? Yeah. It's bad. I'm a bad person. No, none of us. Everybody no, in not. the room hasn't <laughs> seen it. I don't think there's anyone in the street who would say, you know, you didn't see the never ending story part two, so you're a bad <laughs> you're person. You're a bad person. Or the next chapter. Or I auditioned for called. musicals that are playing down the street, and if I don't get the part, I don't go see it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're off the hook. So with the turn to a dance career, there's a whole second part of your. Uh, there's Tammy Stradick, the next chapter, right? That we can talk about with all these other uh, adventures that you've had. But th- I do want to stick to film for one last thing. There is an IMDb credit here. Oh. There's only four on your yeah. on your thing. Um, a couple of other ones after Never Ending Story, and then there's a 2018 credit to come called Ultra Low. That's right. What is What's that? So heck? you're back. I'm 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 backish. Backish. Yeah, backish. Um, well, it's funny, you know, as I started interacting with fans on Twitter and meeting people, everyone kept saying, you know, what are you, why aren't you acting again? When are you going to be in a film again? And, um, you know, part of it is I'm like, well, I'm a mom and I have a dance company <laughs> and I have another company called Paper Canoe and I'm a dance professor at Miramont Manhattan College and I have a lot of stuff to do, you know. But it did make me kind of intrigued and nostalgic and so we did get um, a couple of scripts in the mail from people and um, and then I started being curious and interested so I am looking for acting work now I think it'd be really fun to get back into it look at that Is you ultra heard low, it here ultra low a feature it's a it's kind of like in the in the vein of clerks it's awesome. like awesome. It's, it's like a what do you call those like films that are documentaries but they're real like a mockumentary mockumentary. Mm -hmm. so I like the script because it was about a filmmaker who's trying to make a film and uh, everything goes wrong and it's totally impossible to make and everyone in the film plays themselves Oh great! So you play you. So I play me. Oh, that's oh. the best. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And um, and and I'm not gonna spoil the end, mm-hmm. but um, as somebody who's produced a lot of theater and produced a lot of projects in New York, it is. It's like it's you know it's quixotic. Like it's impossible. You're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, and so, I thought it was sort of fun to celebrate the impossibility of it all. Cool. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. But in the meantime, it's not as you said. You're looking to look to get back into acting and film and TV, but you have been performing yes. all your life. And so let's cover, cover some of the things uh, that you, first of all, you said you were from Israel uh, by way of Iran, and well, then you've lived in New York currently, and you were out in California when you auditioned for this movie. So you've been all over the place. Yeah, in England. Well, So my parents were archaeologists, and they were um, working in Iran because that's where their dig sites were. Um, and then my mother's Israeli and my father's British. So after the revolution, we moved to Israel. And then from there, we moved to England. And then we moved to um, Arizona and then California. And then I moved to New York. Yeah, so. Nice. And so do you have, uh, and I'll mention that you went into dance. Do you have dance skills in from all those parts of the world? Do you, do you <laughs> incorporate like Middle Eastern dance into anything? Or do you focus on oh one gosh. specific kind of dance? 
I well no, I um I focused I did a lot of ballet and I did a lot of modern. Um but I really loved modern dance um partly because it was um one of the only art forms that I'd learned about, which uh, all the trailblazers were women. They were all female. It was Martha Graham and Isadora Duncan and, um, and, and Catherine Dunham. And it was just a really exciting thing because uh, as a little girl, you're like, wow, you know, these, these, this whole art form was essentially kind of brought into being by these really amazing, powerful women. And so I was really drawn to it for that reason. And, um, and it also felt really possible to direct a company and run a company because I'd seen so many examples of it. Tammy um, Stronach Dance, right? Yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so it was really primarily modern dance. But I mean, I love all dance. And I, I love watching hip hop. And I love watching tap dance. And I just feel like a body in motion is so alive and 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 um and that's kind of the goal right is like everything in our life kind of conspires to deaden us and exhaust us and so what are the things that we can tap into that kind of make you go this is amazing i'm alive <laughs> you know so for me dance had that kind of um invigoration and kind of appreciation of the moment have you seen a dance performance where you just said this is the greatest thing i've ever seen oh yeah who, definitely. Would, who would that be well, she passed away, but I don't know. She's pretty obscure. I doubt a lot of people. It's a pretty marginal art form. I, I know that. But Pina Bausch was my biggest hero. And funnily enough, she's German. And she um, she did this really interesting thing where unlike American dance that tends to be just movement, it was lots and lots of theater was in it. So people, there were a lot of like acting vignettes. I would like that. And okay. then there were dancing vignettes. And it was very just... I mean, like, her vision was insane. It was so cinematic. It was like, uh, if there was a, a, a mountain of flowers on stage, it was the size of, like, a, a, a five-story building. And there were, you know, picture uh, dances where there's, like, a, one was called a window washer. And so there are people hanging from the ceiling, like, in these whole grids. And, um, or a floor that splits apart and becomes a river. Like you feel like you're inside a surreal Brazil-like landscape that's inhabited with these sort of really emotional physical scenes and then text and um, yeah, it's kind of like being inside a crazy dream. So I'm completely in love with her work. You just referenced the movie Brazil, right? I did. Point, yes. Points for that. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now I can only imagine how weird that stage show was. <laughs> Uh, and before uh, your own company worked with Flying Machine, what is that? I did. Because uh, it sounds like aerials, or no? I don't know. No, no, no. Oh, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were flying around and flying with machines. ribbons or silks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a theater company. So oh, cool. I was dancing in New York. Uh, I was making my dances and dancing with some companies, but then I. I'm, I'm always missing theater a little bit, and I'm always shoving as much theater into my dances as I can. So Flying Machine was a wonderful, wonderful company. They were like family. We worked together for seven years, and they trained in Europe. Um, there's a school called the Jacques Lecoq School, of, um, and it's based in mime and clown technique, but its, mm -hmm. it's primary goal is to create ensemble theater. So unlike most projects where somebody will direct it, you come in, you see everyone for a short period of three months and then everyone disappears and you never see them again. It was incredibly collaborative. Of course there's a director, but we all sat around the table from day one. We read the script, we talked about it, and the whole project was developed and scaffolded from the ground up as an ensemble. And you, in every play you had seven parts. You were this person and then you change hats and you put this person on and, um, and it's physical theater. So um, as a road back into theater from dance, American acting, you feel an emotion, and if you feel sad, your body follows you. And in this European <coughs> tradition, you put your body in that pose, and if you stay in that pose, then the feeling comes. Mm -hmm. So you end up in the same place, but the doorway in is a little bit different. Mm. And it was a really interesting technique to um, kind of uh, combine my love of dance and theater. It was this beautiful meeting point between these two technical worlds. So uh, we toured all over the U.S. and we were housed at uh, Soho Rep, which is a wonderful theater in Manhattan. They produced four of our shows, um, and we made wonderful stuff. You could do sad shows, you could do uh, vignettes, and you could do hilarious vignettes, and all, Flying all manner. Had, of had a lot of uh, had a lot of clown. It, it was serious, but there was a lot of comedy inside of it, um, and it was fun because we got to do a lot of accents, which I really like to do. <laughs> 
Well, it, you must have been familiar with that, though, because in your home alone, yes. there were two very specific. I had my mother. Also. Yes. Uh. I had my father. <laughs> Wait, how does he sound? Oh, my father's very proper. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And did you have an accent as a kid? I did. I mean, I think if you s look at The NeverEnding Story and you listen closely, it's a slight British accent. I would call it a mid-Atlantic accent because it's, it's very falling proper. somewhere in the water. I had, no, mm -hmm. yeah. I had no problem with it because it was not <coughs> of America. And in mm -hmm. movies, I liked it. if you're not of America, British. You're British. <laughs> but this, we're Italian, but British. But being that it's Fantasia. Ancient Greece, British. British. <laughs> but also, yeah. I mean... The, the voice of Atreyu had a slight accent, and um, I think that there was a, a concerted effort to kind of place, other than Bastion, who comes from the real world, to place some of the sort of more fantastical characters in a non-identifiable suburb. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so then now that brings us to Paper Canoe Company, which yeah. you briefly mentioned, but it's been around for a bit now. Uh, let's see. Well, let me read from your mission statement. Create stories that make kids feel like grown-ups and make grown-ups feel like kids. So please tell me that means you're not talking down to your audience. That's the greatest that's thing the you best. can possibly bring a, yeah. a child, an audience full of children. No, that's really it. I yeah. mean, that's the most important thing. And um, I, I feel like that was, you know, m my daughter is really sophisticated in her tastes and we take her to see excellent music and we take her to see plays that kids aren't supposed to go see and um and as a result she really has a uh, kind of a really uh critical eye and understands what she likes and why and she's great at describing all the details and i feel like you know we really underestimate how influential stories are on the development of young people and um and that, yeah, and if you respect kids and you and you don't talk down to them, they feel so they 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 love it, you know. So, um, and then I think adults get too serious, you know. Mm -hmm. We just get so so <clears throat> bogged down in our stress that um, we forget that really inside of the sort of slightly aging frame, we still you know want to be odd. We still want to be, we still want to believe in magic, you know. And that probably helps both. Uh, audience member and performer. Yeah, I mean, I think that... It probably does great things for you to get up there and be goofy. Totally. No, oh. I mean, that's the that's the whole reason to, to make Paper Canoe is that yeah. I get to still make funny voices and, uh, you know... Uh, and do her accents. And do accents. my accents. <laughs> Where did the name Paper Canoe come from? Because I like it. It creates like a vision in your head, a feeling. Thank you. It, we, it took a while. Um, it was very funny. We were called uh, Shoehorn for a while, Um and before that, not officially, but before that, we were looking for a name, and we were doing a residency, and they were going to announce in the Times who was doing the residency, and we didn't have a name. But we ended up collaborating with a lot of people from Flying Machine who were in the company for a while, and, and so we called ourselves Tail Section because that's who survives the crash, <laughs> you know. I'm like, <laughs> and then the, 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 that's new, nice. yeah, the New Victory called us, like, you really can't, you really can't be called that. And so then, you know, we, we went to – so. It was a process finding finding the name, but I like it because uh, a paper canoe is a vessel for the imagination. And with just one simple piece of paper and a few folds, you go to the lake and you put your little boat down and like you're just transported. And I remember that feeling as a kid. And it's so simple. Like it doesn't, it doesn't take money. It doesn't take time. It's just um, the capacity to kind of you know, imagine. And so even though we want to create these really sophisticated aesthetic worlds, at the heart of it, the message is anybody can uh, transport themselves as long as they keep their imagination well-oiled. What's the reach of the company? So who do you play out to? <laughs> is it local performances? Do you go to schools? Is it both? We do. Um, well, we've done a bunch of things. We had... Um, and it's Brooklyn-based, right? It's Brooklyn-based, yeah. yeah. We did... Uh, we've done um, a kind of play called Light, a Dark Comedy that we were developing through uh, LabWorks residency at the New Victory Theater. And so that was at the Duke, which is off of, it's on Broadway. And then um, we did a bunch of shows in our neighborhood. One show that started out really small, it started out for our, our daughter in a snowstorm. We were stuck in the house, <laughs> speaking of being here versus the East Coast right now. And we didn't have anything. We had socks. And so we made an ace, uh, a sock puppet uh, skit for her. And my husband came up with this. It was 
Aesop's fables, mm-hmm. but Aesop's fables. Ah, see what so you did turned, there. Yeah, it was good. And it, it was so funny. We started for a few local kids, and people like loved it. And so then we moved into a bigger theater. And then by the end, it was like three months. We couldn't like shut the show down, and <laughs> people kept coming. It was sold out. And the kids, oh. I mean, they really thought the socks were alive. It was amazing because oh, it's neat. just a sock, you mm-hmm. know. And so that that was sort of in the spirit of the kinds of things we want to do. So, yeah, our 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 live shows are local for Brooklyn families, and we have a, a following of parents that come. And then after the shows, we always have workshops where we stick around and we meet the kids and we talk to them and we ask them what kind of things they're creating. And I will lead a sock puppet show, a uh, sock puppet making workshop. And then the ki- the parents like send me videos oh. of like the the things the kids are making. So that's really satisfying. But it also was really limiting. Like, we can only play for, you know, a limited amount of people. Mm-hmm. So this year in particular, we've decided to um, branch out a little bit into the digital world. And I think we're going to take uh, the play that I mentioned earlier, Light a Dark Comedy, and turn that into a podcast, um, which I'm really, really excited about because I think with music and voices and getting some really incredible oh, yeah. actors oh, to bring right, it to right. life. Oh, right, right. So that's the newest and latest thing that's to come, <coughs> That's right? to come. All right, cool. Yeah, and right now we're working on something called Beanstalk Jack, which is a folk rock album that um, I uh, helped to kind of with the libretto, but my husband and Jake Silver wrote most of the lyrics in the songs. I did like a chorus, so I'm not going to take credit for the, <laughs> for the music. But I get to sing on it, which is awesome. And um, and uh, made a little video for that. We're going to make another video for that in January. Um, so we're really kind of, um, we're just having fun. We're, we're doing live shows, we're doing videos, and I'm really interested in making this podcast. And but also f- having some digital content so we can reach out to people on a broader spectrum. I like that you're singing again because whenever we were doing research for this interview, we were finding you singing as a child. Yeah. Yeah, and you sound great. Thanks. Yeah, it was really good. Oh, did we find that? Did we? Uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Likes this song. It's not unlike uh, like Jackie this. Ivanko of today or one of them. No, uh, it's great. Yeah. yeah, I like the the the, the synthesizer. It's very eighties. Well, so it's 80s. very on the heels of uh, La Mall. Never, 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 by the way, ex sock dust, a story of Moses with sock puppets. You can have that for free. Oh, there instead of Exodus. <laughs> ex sock dust. <laughs> we had like all the kids. We had stickers for their uh, entryways, so I'm going to use it because we had the Socratary. Uh, yeah, we had the the sock de soleil. Socrates. Socrabat. There you go. Yeah, we had the sockware engineer. So depending on your level of interest, you got your own mm-hmm. professional sock ambition. Yeah, then you have to work in something else like, uh, I don't know how, I'll <laughs> work in nylons and hose, but I will <laughs> before the thing is done. Um, so let's, uh, so the new musical project then, give us the, yeah. the, the, the end result of what it's going to be okay. and, and perhaps where to find it. Papercanoecompany.com yeah. is where to find you can the get current it on, project um, that's ongoing. Yeah, so Paper Canoe Company is where you can see everything we're up to. You can get uh, the CD on Bandcamp. You can stream it or you can get the hard copy if you want. It's available on Amazon and on all kind of Spotify if you want to stream it. Um, So it's kind of an homage to some of the music that I grew up with. I mean, I feel like this whole Paper Canoe Company project is a way of um, revisiting things that I really loved as a kid and, and kind of re reimagining them for my family, for my daughter, for my community, and for kind of, you know, people everywhere who have a little bit of nostalgia for the 80s. So um, it starts in a kind of bluegrass vein because Jack is, um, you know, in the country. And then um, there's a little bit of a Simon and Garfunkel vibe when he meets the blind old man. And then, but once he goes up the beanstalk, it kind of, the giant is like Tom Waits. He's super, oh, super cool. Tom Waitsy. Yeah, it's and creepy then. I yeah, imagine. yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. Scary, yeah. It, and no, and kids would like run out of the room screaming, which is all always good. Oh, I <laughs> love. I, I, <laughs> love <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love scaring children. <laughs> so, and so there's all kinds of um, 
kind of homages. I Tom to Waits some... played the uh, guy who eats the rocks in Never Ending Story. Oh, it? it looks like it could yeah, be. Yeah, it looks like him. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so it kind of has a, a musical journey through a lot of uh, vintage rock and roll that uh, we really love. And, um, and we changed it. I wanted to... Um, take a classic tale, but I think, you know, as cultures evolve, we do need to look at the stories and see how we can make them potent for ourselves. And so we changed it out. <laughs> I was at the dinner table with my daughter and I'm like, well, so then he goes and he steals the giant stuff and then he steals it more and then he kills him. And my daughter's like, this is, this is not a good boy, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's being bad. Like, well, you know, serfdom, was complicated in Europe, <laughs> and th th there was this sense, this isn't going to work. <laughs> you know, we're in like <laughs> 2000, and so, um, so we kind of looked at the story and asked ourselves how we could make it relevant uh, and, and meaningful to us, and I think a really big problem for kids is bullying these days, and, um, and I think that it's always been a problem, but I don't know, for some reason I feel like in, it's almost gotten worse and um, or maybe it's just one of those things we're drawing more attention to so the the story is Jack goes up the beanstalk and he goes from this sort of simple folksy world into this like technicolor guitar world and um, and the the giant has a daughter instead of a wife and as soon as Jack meets her they fall in love oh. and she's been trapped in this gilded cage but she's still still she, probably pretty giant though right? she's or, no she's normal oh, she's size oh, she has a giant she's normal size. giant did yet. <laughs> yeah right. and um and and she has everything she has money she has you know all of the guitars and instruments you could possibly do but she doesn't have anyone to play with she doesn't have a band she doesn't have anybody to make music with and um, and she's sort of hidden up there, and he's horrible to her. And so her and Jack fall in love, and instead of stealing the giant stuff, he steals the most important thing that the giant has, which is his daughter. He steals her heart. And they run away together, and they make music. And I think, you know, the theme that you, you can't always control the world, and you can't always control the things that are good and bad in the world, but you can... Uh, insist on creating your own corner that is uh, meaningful to you and and the only way to do that is with with other people that are good people so that's the message this is the story about being stout jack lives with his mom in a little old shack when i walk in and he hasn't come back don't you worry about being stout jack he went up, 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 up so high, up, 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 to the sky, up, 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 don't know why, now his head's in the clouds and he's fancy free, taller now than the tallest tree, head's in the clouds and he's fancy free. Glad I woke and up today. Have you noticed again that the daughter <laughs> produced, the, you know, produced it into a newer, more um, on target kind of brand? You definitely yeah, gotta keep, keep her, this daughter yeah, involved. Keep her close. Yeah, because <laughs> she's, she's like, yeah, yeah, that's great and everything, but it's a little, it's a little dark. Let's go into this other option. <laughs> and Beanstalk Jack is at separate uh, dot com, correct? To go check uh, that out as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. She's six. Yeah, she's little. She's by awesome. the way, everyone, she's a teeny tiny baby. Oh, she who's gives us notes keeps on everything. The, <laughs> keeps everything. them in line, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you a question we ask everyone I bring here into the Admiral's Club. That's our studio. It's very close to the airport. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite movie of all time? So, I love the original Blade Runner. Oh, there you go. That I is do. a good one. Um, I love Brazil. I mentioned it before. I'm not going to get one, am I? I'm going to get a couple. No, you're going to get a couple. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love, I love those, you know, slightly... Um, sci-fi dystopian um I, i'll watch i mean i love the hunger games i love all those things i love i like well there isn't a teen in a movie today who isn't in a utopian future where someone's trying to kill him the giver yes, maze yes, runner well, hunger games kill the teens it's that's true like it's true but i like the ones that um i do like the ones that are less about the action and adventure and a little bit more about uh, the kind of dilemma of living in a world that you know is wrong, mm -hmm. um, but everyone pretends like it's okay. And oh, oh, that takes you right back to Huckleberry Finn. 
that just messed me up when I was like 15 <laughs> and I read it for the first time because the part where Huck is going, well, I guess I'm just going to have to be a horrible person because I'm going to help this guy. And that just blew my mind. I'm like, no, you're right. Why, why does he think he's wrong? Ah, And it just really messed me up. Because all of society so, is wrong in, in right. having slaves. And he had to decide to go against society yeah. to do what he thought was the worst thing ever. Well, I think, Fascinating. I, think, I think that, you know, that is one of the sort of big themes of, of humanity, right? Like how, 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 do, you, how do you be a, a good person in, in a world that's constantly trying to kind of pull you, pull you off course? And um, so those are good stories. Well, I want to mm-hmm. deep dive on, right. on Brazil, though, okay. uh, of all those you picked. Yeah. What, Terry Gilliam makes movies that look like no one else's. Yes. The I mean, visual poetry of his films is incredible and I think for me coming from dance and and also working in physical theater I'm as interested in what the poetry of a shot is saying as the text I think there's so much to see in the composition of of the colors and of the costumes and um and so you must yeah, like I mean, you must like Kubrick I do yeah, I talk love about it. a guy I just love it. I love every it. frame of painting frame. or whatever that phrase no is. it is yeah. and those are my favorite films I feel like I, I, I mean I love text but visual poetry for me is I could watch it over and over again because you keep discovering another layer inside of it and yeah, where does he get some of these sets too like the finale where they're into some huge thing where you know um, yeah what is his name now Jonathan Price's character uh I forget the Are character Are we back name. to Brazil? We're back to Brazil. Okay. Uh, he's sitting in the chair and Palin's oh. going to work on him. And he's got this gigantic... Where are they? Are they inside like a nuclear reactor or it's something? I mean, they probably are. office. Yeah, sure <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, every set in there, it was just amazing. Amazing. And, uh, and, and almost a, not afraid to let you know it was other... Like otherworldly, unrealistically un- otherworldly. You yeah. Know? It's like our, our future isn't one you can touch and feel. It's completely out there. <clears throat> Now, before uh, we were doing a little chatting real quick, and we found out that Paul's favorite movie is Raiders, mm-hmm. and that your dad <laughs> is an and mom apparently are archaeologists. <laughs> so, was why wasn't that your favorite movie? Oh, I love that movie. Oh, all right, it's a great movie. Is it dead on? Is but, that how it really works? But I had works? to work through it because <laughs> I, it was initially pitched to me as a true disappointment. So I had to <laughs> I had to find my own way to it because. Ouch. We just arrived in this country. Um, we sort of bounced around the globe. We arrived in this country. My father finally landed a position uh, in Tucson as an archaeologist, a professorship there. And he, we were really, really new to the country. And I remember him saying, you know, oh, darling, you know, there's, a, there's an archaeological film uh, down at the theater. And I, I think I should go with some colleagues of mine from <laughs> university. And, you know, and so we, I, off my parents went to see this archaeological film. They came back, and my father was just very distraught. He said, this was not a documentary at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sort of our introduction to America and, you know. Big... I thought they were going to unearth Grecian catacombs. But now, but now, <laughs> no, yeah. Then... But what's so great is that over the years, his students, um, you know, he, he has this very dapper way about him. And he is, he is kind of, you know, mysterious in that way. And he's grown to really love Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he has a hat. Oh. Exactly oh. like it. it, it yeah. It, it, uh, I'm making up a verb here, but it coolifies that guy's profession. <laughs> it does. That movie. Mm-hmm. And so, and he's, and it's also his evolution from like arriving here and then just having a blast with it was, was nice to watch. That's that's because it's the greatest movie of all time. See now, Paul, you have found an actual physical person who has been an archaeologist who can talk to you about your movie. I'm still waiting to meet a Ghostbuster, so that'll help me out. Mm-hmm. Keep waiting. Yeah, <laughs> keep waiting. Well, they're probably out they're there. They're probably. probably I just got to meet one. Everything out mm-hmm. there. All right. Well, that uh, wraps another uh, TMG interview. I like taking TMG. It, you know, for the movie guys, and kind of taking it away from TMZ because they're dumb. Oh. They ask dumb questions. Yeah, we, we have we, fun here. W- look at this. The song is the best. It really is. Do you wake up to this song in your head? Do you oh. hear this in your dreams? <laughs> you I would, can't get it out of her head. I would put this as my alarm clock. Oh, what a yeah. great way to wake up in the morning. You're yeah. like, mm. Thank uh, you, guys. Follow us on Twitter at TheMovieGuys, Facebook.com slash TheMovieGuys, as well as YouTube, iTunes, Instagram. All that nonsense for daily jokes, articles, media links, and more. Thanks to Tammy Stronach. Yay! Where can we follow Tammy again? Yes, uh, it, your Twitter handle is... NeverEndingTammy. And, <laughs> and it's T-A-M-I. Yes. And uh, PaperCanoeCompany.com. And Facebook, PaperCanoeCompany. And BeanstalkJack. BeanstalkJack.com. 
Cool. And as ever, you can find out everything we're up to, including reviews, articles, and more interviews at themovieguys.net. Thank you, Tammy, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.